I'm Michael Thomas. I'm a professor of cognitive neuroscience at Birkbeck, University of London. I am director of the University of London Centre for Educational Neuroscience, and I've also been a, a member of the Learners' Council for a number of years. It's an interesting question what we mean by educational neuroscience. I would view the field, it's a research field, as being part of the broader learning, learning sciences. The learning sciences originally comprised an interaction between psychology, education and computer science. That's a, ton of, a field of understanding how m machines learn. And really since the, the late 1990s there's been an increasing understanding of brain function driven predominantly by technological advances in, in brain imaging. And educational neuroscience is, is a contribution of our understanding of neural mechanisms of learning to the, uh, the broader learning sciences. Now, educational neuroscience has been some debate about that name. Uh, it portrays it as a field which is a branch of neuroscience. And uh, kind of foregrounding neuroscience in that way isn't, isn't necessarily universally uh, agreed with. For instance, in America, they call the field mind, brain, and, and education as an attempt to portray it quite rightly as the interaction between those three different fields. I think an interesting alternative uh, title for the field is, is the science of learning. Really that's, that's highlighting the, the, the methodology, the fact that, that we want to use scientific methods to investigate learning, to use the, the uh, evidence-based approaches. Uh, fr from my interest is, is looking at brain mechanisms of learning, that's only one angle. It complements different levels, sociological level, uh, pure kind of educational research. Uh, so I, I'm happy with a, uh, an emphasis on evidence-based approaches. So there is an active debate at the moment about the relevance of studying the brain to education with some people saying it's really too low level. And I think in a sense that's right. There's, there's never going to be an absolutely direct classroom implication of any neuroscience or, or brain imaging data. But I think the important thing is that we're focusing on mechanism and an understanding of, of how things work. So you could be skeptical. You could say, look, education is about uh, behavioral outcomes and it's the effect of instruction on behavioural outcomes and why should we worry about what's going on in the brain so long as uh, kids are learning what they're supposed to be learning. But I would argue that, that uh, what we need to understand both from psychology and from neuroscience is a, is a mechanistic understanding of what's going on. So I can think of a, a, an analogy. Uh, we've known for uh, 400 years or so that the bark of the cinchona tree is useful in treating malaria uh, we know that. Why should you dig any deeper than that? You know, there's, there's a useful piece for, for like healers, eat some of this bark, that's fine. But in those 400 years, we've had the growth of the natural sciences, we've understood biology, biochemistry, we've understood what the active agent is, uh, the quinine uh, in the cinchona bark, and now we have a multitude of different treatments for malaria, and preventative medicines from malaria. And you couldn't necessarily have anticipated 400 years ago that the natural sciences, which were kind of basic research, would produce that much greater understanding and downstream much greater bene benefits of understanding that the mechanisms of, of operation. So I think we're, we're kind of at the stage where a lot of the time we know what works in the classroom. But I'd argue for this deeper level of understanding mechanism to downstream optimize outcomes and give us a broader picture of why what works does work and, and how to improve things to get them even better. So one question is, how much neuroscience do teachers need to know? Do they need to be engaging with neuroscience 
uh, literature, the latest papers on coming from brain imaging or genetics, for example? I would argue no. I think teachers need to uh, have a, a gist of an understanding about how the brain works and to get a sense of how that uh, influences how children are likely to respond in the classroom. Uh, I think the broader picture is that, that teachers need to be uh, critical, they need to be evidence-driven, and I would like as, as an ambition to persuade them of the importance of being interested in mechanism. Now, teachers' understanding of mechanism, I don't expect that to be at the level of neurons. Uh, I think of one of me, my colleagues, uh, Paul Howard Jones, characterizes learning, if you could get to this higher level, in terms of a, a, a cycle of uh, engage, engage students' attention, their interest, of construct knowledge through teaching methods, through understanding the specific knowledge relevant to the domain, and then consolidation of ways to ensure that information stays there and is accessible and can be used flexibly. Now, you can look at the neuroscience. I have to say the neuroscience of learning is, is some of the most complicated there is. I, I'm going to wave my hand a bit and say that, that depending on, you, on how you count them, there are about eight different learning systems in the brain that are continuously interacting and interplaying with each other. From the point of view of the, the classroom teacher, you just want to see the products of that and think about uh, how you can maximize the interaction between those eight different systems. So there is this negotiation about trying to understand mechanism and then to think about the user, how you can convey the best knowledge to use that information. I'd say over the last five or ten years, some of the key messages that have come from educational neuroscience would be to think about different pathways of influence on, on children's uh, learning outcomes. And to think uh, partly in terms of the different topics and the core skills uh, that one needs to learn. So in, in literacy, we understand about the, the core skills of, of uh, what's called phonology, of, of understanding speech sounds and of uh, orthography, recognizing um, print. But we're increasingly trying to identify in other topic areas what those core skills are and the kind of brain systems uh, involved and how they develop. So we think now in, in terms of numeracy, the, the importance of uh, understanding number sense of, of quantity and of linking that to identification of, of individual objects and then of linking that into the language system and number facts and of, of automating procedural knowledge to do with number facts in, in calculation skills. And the very latest research is looking at, at science understanding and the importance in science understanding actually of inhibiting, of suppressing your background everyday knowledge. For example, we're trying to teach five and six year olds that the, the earth is round. But they've spent a number of years going out and playing on football pitches that seem to them completely flat. So uh, one of the projects we're actually investigating at the moment is whether we can help children uh, suppress or ignore that, that inconsistent everyday knowledge to help them learn scientific concepts. So there's a, a lot of research that's focusing on the core abilities underlying uh, the learning of, of different topics. But I'd also emphasize uh, this other pathway of thinking about the brain as a biological organ, that it needs nutrients, that it needs energy, that the brain needs to consolidate its knowledge during sleep. So some of these aspects about learning, which really don't go via psychology, they're more about thinking about uh, does the child have the right diet? Does the child uh, have the right amount of sleep? There are other key messages that are emerging from recent research. I'd say um, some of them are reinforcing what we already knew, what, what teachers are familiar with, is that children differ a lot. And one of the key elements of teaching is personalization or, or teaching to the, the child's, not just their ability, but also their knowledge. And we're uncovering these key learning principles that uh, engage children the best. Uh, this is, goes back to Vygotskyan ideas, 
um, that what children are learning should be just in advance of what they currently know. But that emphasizes the importance of personalization of learning uh, and it presents a challenge to, for example, uh, teaching a whole classroom at once. And, and some of the latest research is trying to engage what we've understood about video games, of using technology uh, to support teachers to provide personalized learning environments uh, for children that can adapt to where those children are at. Now, clearly, there's a technological challenge. We've been trying to run a, a big intervention project across around 100 schools. And when we try and engage with the current IT uh, in schools, it, it's so diverse uh, and at different levels that we understand the challenges of actually IT solutions. But we're beginning to, to get a vision of how we could use technology to support the work of teachers and to optimize the outcome of, of personalization of learning experiences. I think over the longer period one can uh, envisage kind of like a cultural change where uh, lots of, of different groups are, are pulling in the same direction. I think it's really important that there's, there be a kind of cottage industry of research amongst teachers to try to in, engage the interest in teachers in, in what works in their classroom and to, to have teachers generate ideas that they can feed through uh, to researchers. And then researchers taking those ideas and going off and trying to understand this, this kind of the dialogue between educators uh, and, and the researchers themselves. There is also a place for uh, basic research. And I, I don't think that should be underestimated. There's still a lot we don't know about the brain. Just for example, about the interactions between the, the limbic system our, our kind of base of emotions and, and how our emotions and our goals influence um, our long-term learning, but our moment-to-moment -moment learning. What, what motivates a child to pay attention in the classroom? What distracts them? Uh, how do you uh, reward them? How do you sanction them? What is the right combination? So I think we do need to do some basic scientific research, but once we have that within this wider dialogue, an uh, interaction, between uh, translational scientists, between teachers themselves. I think it will be a new culture, a new vision for the field. Will it all change tomorrow? Is there going to be a revolution from understanding mechanisms of learning in the brain? My guess would be it's going to be incremental. Lots of, of small changes that, that uh, lead to quite a large change in outcome. We should be aware though that, that um, at least as we understand how things work at the moment, schools have, have the lesser contribution to learning outcomes, educational outcomes in children. And we should be aware that the home environment, the family environment, probably explains more of the variation. So that's why we need to pay a kind of wider attention to, to the factors uh, influencing um, children's learning. Uh, I, sh I think there is, I think, a revolution out there to be had. And I'll give an example that there is uh, a learning system which is, uses IT solutions where even children as young as six, and six or seven can be proactive uh, engagers in exploring virtual environments uh, where they interact with the teacher uh, more as a, as a kind of guru who just points them in directions where the children are in charge of their own learning, where they self-modulate between uh, passive learning and active learning where indeed they uh, construct their own learning problems and interact uh, in a virtual social environment with other learners of the same age. And that um, produces amazing results. Uh, very quickly the, the children learn uh, so that they know more than the teacher. Uh, the disadvantage with this approach is that I'm talking about my seven-year-old's online computer gaming uh, and very quickly he knows much more than I do, but it, it gives you a clue that there are very powerful um, uh, pathways to learning that we don't yet know how to utilize in an educational uh, environment. So we can see there is a prize there, 
but it, I'd say the field has struggled to gamify education and we don't yet know enough about you know maybe there are aspects of learning times tables that are never going to be exciting enough to engage kids but we know you need to have those skills and have them reasonably automatic to support a whole lot of other more sophisticated skills so there are challenges may, maybe there is a revolution to be had but my suspicion is that it's going to be lots of small gains uh, that contribute to a big change both focusing on on the school but what happens in the homes as well So based on where educational neuroscience is at the moment, let me think about my top five key messages. Uh, number one, um, educational outcomes are the combination of many small effects. So it's a bit like the, the pro athlete. It's all those 1% gains you can find in different areas that make uh, add up to uh, a big difference, except when things go wrong except when children have learning disabilities, except where there is severe deprivation in the home environment. So when things are going okay, you have to combine lots of small benefits to get a, a big increase. Second major point is that um, at least as we see things at the moment, the home environment is probably more important for educational outcomes uh, than what's going on in the school. So the more we can do in the homes, the more we can offer uh, resources and support to children, um, the better for uh, educational outcomes. The third point is often we need to think about biology before psychology, that the brain is a biological organ. It needs to have uh, breakfast before it goes to school. Uh, it's good if children are fit, that there's good delivery of, of oxygen to the brain. Uh, and that the children are not stressed and that they have a good night's sleep. These are ways to, to optimize uh, learning outcomes. Uh, there has in the past been quite a strong focus, often uh, government-led, on the early years and the importance of an early years. But I think perhaps that argument has been overstated. The early years, certainly things can go wrong in the early years with long-lasting effects. But really the, the early years are where we create potential in children. But one has to think about the rest of education as the time when we realize that potential. And particular research in, in cognitive neuroscience is focusing on adolescent brain development, that, that those higher level thinking, planning, organizing skills of getting on with peers, about deciding the right uh, ways to behave in different complex situations, those skills are still developing into adolescence and there are still opportunities to improve those skills. So I think it's important to think not just about the early years but about lifespan uh, development and learning. And lastly I'd emphasize the fact that uh, the brain is plastic across the lifespan, that it's never too late to start learning anything Different parts of the brain are more or less plastic at different ages, but there's always some plasticity, there's always an opportunity to learn.